Okay, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Last week we were covering the integrals and the sharait of the prayer. Last week we covered the integrals and the outside and internal integrals of the prayer. Today we uh, we touched on some of the wajibat last week as well. We're going to we're going to begin from the wajibat this week again. And then we're going to, inshallah, cover the sunan and then the adab of the prayer. And um, we may then look at the prayer in general and how to go about doing it. So, uh, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, we first begin with the wajibat of prayer. Now, these are the most important because it's very easy to remember the fara'id of the prayer. It's very easy to remember the integrals of the prayer because there's only, you know, five plus seven. Uh, if you take them to be in, in general, I mean, you can break those five and seven up, but in general, there, there's only that many. The wajibat are many more, and they could be missed out more often. They could be, you know, you would have a problem with a wajib more often than with a fard. You know, because it's very difficult to miss a sajda. But it's, it's quite easy to actually hurry up in something and not do itma'nan to ma'nina, which means not to be reposeful. You've missed the wajib. Very easy that you may go into, uh, go into ruku without actually... Um, reciting a surah or you may miss surah al-fatiha and get into a surah straight away you may recite aloud when you're meant to recite silently if you're an imam or something of that nature so the wajibat are very essential to know once you know the wajibat you know the fara'id then it's, it kind of becomes easy so let's look at the wajibat today so the wajibat mentions that there are 18 wajibat in the prayer according to Nurul Lidha Number one is the recitation of Surah Al-Fatiha. I mentioned this last time that reciting Surah Al-Fatiha itself is a wajib according to the Hanafi Madhab. It's lesser than a fard, right? Uh, you shouldn't be confused about this. In other madhahid, the fard and wajib is the same thing. You have to be, um, if you miss this out, it necessitates a, a sajda to sahu. Now, the effects of missing a wajib, let me mention that before we go into the wajib. If you miss a fard, your salat is uh, invalid. It just has to be done again. You don't have even the basic integrals uh, intact to, for it to be considered a salat. If you miss a wajib, or you delay a wajib, or you delay a fard, then you can salvage the prayer by making a sadda to sahu at the end, a prostration of forgetfulness. However, if you miss a wajib on purpose, then you should repeat your prayer. It's wajib to repeat your prayer. Which means that if you didn't, your fard of the prayer, the obligation would be absolved, although you would be sinful for having missed the wajib on purpose and having not re repeated the prayer. So it's wajib to repeat the prayer within the time, within the time of the prayer. Right? If there's still time left for the prayer and then uh, the next salat time has not come in. Now, if you miss a wajib by mistake, it, it was a mistake, you missed the wajib, you delayed the wajib, then if you remember within the prayer, you should make a sajda to sahu, a prostration of forgetfulness, then it will be completed. That's what that prostration is for. It completes the mistake that you made. It's a special, you know, uh, plaster as such. You know, it completes. However, if you forget to do that, then it's mustahab. It's recommended to repeat the prayer within the time if you can. Which means if you didn't, your prayer is okay, uh, your, your prayer is valid, you haven't been sinful, but it would have been more preferable and better, superior for you to have repeated the prayer and got you know, the complete reward. But if you didn't, you wouldn't be sinful. But this is within the time. Once the time has expired of the prayer, then you, know, you can't repeat the prayer. So, number one, recitation of Surah Al-Fatiha. Number two, reciting any other long verse or three short verses or one whole surah after the Fatiha in every rak'ah of a sunnah prayer, a wajib prayer, and a nafil prayer, and only in the first two rak'ahs of a fard prayer. Therefore, in the third and fourth rak'ah of a fard prayer, it's not wajib to recite Surah Al-Fatiha or some surah or verses after that. It's only sunnah to recite Surah Al-Fatiha in the third and fourth or third or fourth rak'ah of a fard prayer, like the four rak'ahs of Dhuhr, the third and fourth rak'ah of the, of the fard of Dhuhr, or the third rak'ah in Maghrib. It's only sunnah. When I say it's only sunnah, I'm just trying to compare it with being fard. I'm not saying it's only sunnah that you don't have to do it. Right? It just means that it's a sunnah, and it's not fard or wajib. But in every other salat besides a fard prayer, sunnah, wajib, and mustahab, 
every single rak'ah requires wujuban as a wajib, a fatiha and something after that, at least three small verses or one long verse or a whole small surah or something of that nature. The other thing is specifying the reading of Surah Al-Fatiha for the first two rakats of the Fard Salat. I already mentioned that. That's the third wajib, uh, which is the first two rakats of the Fard prayer needs a Surah Al-Fatiha plus the Surah. Now, because Fatiha is wajib and a Surah is wajib afterwards, it's also wajib that the Fatiha be first. So that's an independent wajib for the Fatiha to be before the Surah. So if somebody by mistake recites a Surah first, he begins the prayer and goes into Kul Hu Allahu Ahad. Then he says, I haven't read Fatiha yet. Then he begins the Fatiha. He has to make a Sajda to Sahu because he's missed the Wajib, which was to make the Fatiha first. Number five, to make Sajda with the nose and the forehead. So the forehead was Fard to have on the ground at least. But to add the nose on the ground is Wajib. So if somebody missed that out, they have to make sajda to sahu. Number six, to make the second sajda of the first rak'ah before proceeding to any other action. Which means the second sajda of any salat, because the first and second sajda are fard in themselves. Both of them, they're integrals. However, the second sajda needs to be connected to the first one. Which means, well, the only way that could not take place is if you stood up after the first sajda and proceeded into the second rak'ah and forget, forgot to do the second sajda, then fulfill the second sajda later on. So although you fulfill the obligation of the prayer of making two sajdas for every rak'ah, however you've missed the wajib which is to put them together and to do the second one before you do anything else. Alright? Do you understand that? That's a kind of a technical point. That the second sajda has to be connected to the first sajda and it should be done before you do anything else of the second rak'ah. Likewise, the second sajda of the second rak'ah needs to be done before you do anything of the third rak'ah and so on. In other words, they need to be together. Otherwise, it would necessitate a sajda sahu. To perform every posture with ease and calm, that is also a wajib. That means being tranquil. That means being reposeful. I mean, the, the basics of this is that it should be done in such a way that when you get into that posture, for example, you get into ruku, or you get up from the ruku, your limbs must all come to rest. They should not be in motion before you get to the next one. That's the best way to explain this. When you get into sajda, you need to remain as long in sajda. Obviously, you have to recite Surah Subhan Rabbi al -Azim, but let's say somebody could recite that very fast and just peck down and peck up, right? That would be missing the wajib because you've got down, your body's still in motion and you're starting to come back up. So your motion has not stopped. So getting into such a ruku, motion stop. Then get up, Sami Allahu liman hamida, stop. Everything should come to rest. Should be no motion. And then you carry on. That is what is a tuma'nina. And many people have this problem. Many people have a problem with this. So it's, it's actually, you have to do a siddhar sahu, otherwise you should be repeating your prayer. Uh, if you do it by mistake, as a bad habit, I mean a bad habit is a bad habit actually, uh, you should be uh, recommended, it's, it's recommended to repeat the prayer unless you do it on purpose. To perform the first sitting, which means that the, if you remember the last sitting of every prayer was a fard. Besides that every other sitting is a wajib. So for example the second rak'ah sitting in a maghrib or isha or dhuhr prayer is a wajib. If you missed it, your salat would still be intact, you should do a sadr sahu. Alright, in, in, uh, in Fajr Fard, there's only one sitting, and since that's the last sitting in the second rak'ah, that is a Fard sitting, that's not a wajib sitting. The, the Fajr does not have a wajib sitting because there's only one sitting and that's the last one, and the last one is always a Fard. Uh, number nine, to recite the Tashahud, although the sitting of the last rak'ah is a Fard, and every other sitting is a wajib, to recite the tashahud during that sitting is a wajib at all times. To recite the tashahud in the first sitting and in the last sitting. This is number 9 and 10. Number 11, to stand up immediately for the third rak'ah after the tashahud without delay. If you are making, performing more than two rak'ahs, a three rak'ah or a four rak'ah prayer, immediately after the second rak'ah, after you re recite, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh, you have to get up immediately. It's a wajib to get up immediately, otherwise it would necessitate a siddhar sahu if you began by mistake to recite the salawat and Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
making salam two times. There's a difference of opinion here. The strong opinion I believe is to make salam on one side, on the right hand side, that's wajib. And that's the last wajib of the prayer. That's the last wajib of the prayer. And even in that regard, only the word as-salam is wajib. Not even alaykum. That is actually very, a very significant point. Because if somebody joined the prayer, he came to the masjid late, there was a congregation, and the imam was saying, as-salamu alaykum, as-salam. Once he says as-salam, you join the prayer, you're not part of the prayer. So you have to catch it before then. So once you're in salam, the first salam takes you out of the prayer. The second salam is a sunnah. It's a completion. So technically, you would be out of the prayer by the first salam, by the word salam. But to say alaykum uh, salamu alaykum is sunnah mu'akkadah. To read the qunut in the witr prayer, to read the qunut, to recite the qunut in the witr prayer, in the third raka'ah of a witr prayer, and according to the Hanafis, the three rakats have to be together. There is, according to the Hanafis, there is no such thing as a one rak'ah prayer. It's not valid. There's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, Rak'atun wahidatun butayra. Which means that a single rak'ah is, like uh, is like an animal with its tail cut off. It's defective. It's not, it's not complete. The hadith has been actually related uh, with a sahih isnad by Ibn Hajar, uh, Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, the great Shafi'i scholar. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, basically, if, any, uh, if the Shafi'is uh, and the Malikis and the Hanbalis, they m- split two rakats and one rak'ah, as a Hanafi, it's not, uh, you cannot do that at all. Uh, you cannot perform uh, to, uh, them separately. They have to be performed um, they have to be performed separate. Uh, they have to be performed together. And in the third rak'ah, the other difference is that uh, the Hanafis recite the kunut before the ruku, but uh, after reciting the Fatiha and the surah, in the third rak'ah they raise their hands, say Allahu Akbar. Raising the hands is a sunnah, right? But saying Allah, uh, uh, reciting the kunut, is wajib. What is the kunut? Does it have to be Allahumma inna nasta'inuka wa nastaghfiruka, the regular kunut uh, that you... It doesn't have to be that. That one is not wajib. That's sunnah. Kunut means a dua to Allah. So if somebody just said Allahumma khfirli, that would be considered a kunut. So kunut means to pray to Allah, to ask requests from Allah. That much is sufficient. That's the wajib will be enacted by doing that. But to recite Allahumma inna nasta'inuka wa nastaghfiruka, it's a sunnah to recite that kunut. Now, if you're making your qadas, your make-up prayers from the past, the wajib is also necessary to make up in the Hanafi school. So Ibn Abidin al-Shami has written that since raising the hands uh, when you say Allahu Akbar before the kunut in witr, it's sunnah. If you're making qada in the daytime and you don't want people to know you're making a wajib qada because if you raise your hands, a Hanafi raising his hands in the middle of a prayer, it's going to sound really strange. They're going to either think he's become shafi or... He's re- making his witr prayer. They said you don't have to, you can abandon raising the hands. So they, because, you know, uh, making a qadab is a good thing, but at the end it's still a sin that you'd miss the prayer. And exposing a sin to others is not a good idea. So they've taken that into consideration there that you can leave raising your hands if you're making qada at another time for wajib, for the witr. To recite takbir of the Eid Salat. You know, the, uh, in the Hanafis, they recite three extra takbirs in the first and three extra takbirs in the second rak'ah. Um, they are wajib to recite. So the muqtadi should also recite them. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. To say the takbir of ruku before going into ruku in the second rak'ah of the two Eids. Normally, besides the initial opening takbir, Allahu Akbar, which is a, a fard, an integral, Every other takbir of the prayer is sunnah. But there's one exception. In the Eid prayer, in the second rak'ah, at the end of, this, uh, at the end of reciting Fatiha plus Surah, in the second rak'ah, you recite the three extra takbirs of Eid. 
the three extra takbirs, then you say the fourth takbir which is to take you into ruku. That should be sunnah. In Eid prayer that becomes wajib. To differentiate it and to make sure they read it as opposed to the three, meaning added to the three that are extra. And thereafter we have, for the imam, this is a, a wajib special for the imam to recite the qira'a aloud in Fajr, Maghrib and Isha. It's wajib for him to recite aloud. And in Zuhr and Asr, it's wajib for him to recite silently. Which means if he does the opposite amount of three uh, small verses, then he has to do sajdah al sahur But let's say he made a mistake and just said, uh, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, aloud in Zuhr by mistake. Or he said it silently in another prayer or two verses. That would be okay if he continues in the correct way. What about a person praying alone? For a person praying alone, it's easy. They can actually recite aloud if they want to. They can recite aloud if they want to in any prayer. Or they could recite silently. But it would be better to recite silently in Dhuhr and Asr and better to recite aloud in Fajr, Maghrib and Isha if they were praying alone. For women, they ask this question often that is it permissible, it's better not to. Uh, to raise the voice for women. I mean, everybody should recite loud enough. I mean, how much, what is the minimum amount of recitation? This is another issue that needs to be clarified here. There's two opinions about this. About the minimum amount of recitation that, needs, that will be considered recitation. Because, you know, we're in the mode today of when we say we read something, we're talking about scanning it with our mind. You pick up a report or a book and, or a newspaper, you don't utter the words out. You don't articulate the words. You just read it in your mind. Qira'ah is not that. Qira'ah is actually articulating the huruf and the words. So uh, based on that, the minimum that could be considered, the minimum degree of recitation, according to one of the Hanafi opinions, is that your lips must move at least. Even if you can't hear yourself, but your lips must move. And the other opinion is that your lips must move and also you should be able to hear your own recitation at least, even if, if it's not loud enough for others to hear it. So you can go with the view that at least your lips must move, but if it's anything beyond that, the lips don't even move and you know, you're basically just thinking it, uh, thinking it out, then that would not be considered recitation. So if you, didn't, if you did the Fatiha and the Surah in your mind, your Salah would not be done because you have not even recited one verse. You know, you have not articulated one verse. So th that, that's something to be taken into consideration. How loud does the Imam have to recite? Let's say there's a big jama'ah, big group, no microphone, right? Does he have to recite loud enough for everybody to hear? He doesn't have to. He needs to recite in a moderate voice. Those who can hear him, alhamdulillah, those who can't, then the sound needs to be passed on to them, meaning the uh, the takbirs of the movements needs to be passed on to them by a mukabbir which is somebody behind right by a mukabbir but he doesn't he's not obliged to read so you don't have to have the loudest person as the imam you know otherwise that would be necessary he just needs to recite loud enough that he can you know recite conveniently because reciting too loud uh, may cause a person make, make mistakes so that's the amount of uh, loudness Likewise in Jumu'ah and Eid prayer, Taraweeh and Witr prayer in Ramadan, it's wajib to recite aloud in every congregation uh, that normally takes place. If you're making Qada prayer in Jama'ah, and it's a Qada of Fajr, Maghrib or Isha, you would recite aloud as well, even though you are making the Qada in the daytime. And likewise for Dhuhr and Asr, you would recite it low, right? There's one other issue. If somebody missed reciting a surah in the first two rakats of a fad prayer, then what he can do is he can, uh, after the fatiha in the third or fourth rak'ah, he can actually add the surah on them and his wajib would be accomplished. This is like, let's say an imam misses a surah in the first, uh, first rak'ah or second rak'ah. So when he gets up for the third or fourth rak'ah, if he's going to repeat the surah, if he's going to uh, recite the surah in the third or fourth rakah, he would have to recite the fatiha aloud as well. Had he missed it, I mean, it doesn't normally happen. This is just the issue. 
However, if somebody misses the Fatiha in the first two rakats, you're not going to repeat it. Uh, you're not going to make two Fatihas in the third or fourth rakah. You'll just make a Siddur Sah. So these were the wajibat of the prayer. These were the wajibat of the prayer. If you have any questions about this, just pass them forth. Um, and inshallah, we'll take care of those questions. Now let's look at the sunnahs of the prayer, of the Salat. According to the Hanafi school, there are, uh, according to Nur al-Lidha, there are 51 sunnahs in the prayer. But again, this is uh, just Allama Sharun Bulali's way of dissecting everything and putting everything into perfect you know, perspective, you know, in, in good detail so that you know, you know exactly what it is. That's why I really like the Hajj chapter in Nur al-Lidha because of the way he puts out the wajibat and everything and he, because there's a lot of confusion in Hajj many people have a lot of confusion if I miss this because it's very technical sometimes and the way Nur al-Ridha does it is it's very good it's very good so there are 51, 51 sunnahs of the prayer number one is raising the hands for the opening takbir so saying the opening takbir Allahu Akbar is fard but raising the hands for it is a sunnah mu'akkadah. It's, it's a sunnah. Where do you raise it up to? You raise it up to your ears. You have the palms straight out with all the fingers together except the thumb which is outstretched towards the earlobe and touching the earlobe. And it should be as straight as possible so your whole body is facing the qibla in a very straight way. So the hand should not be bent uh, as much as possible. The palm should be completely straight. Right? It requires a bit of a pushing the shoulders back, which is a good form of exercise as well. Right? But it should be as straight as possible. So, you know, this loose way that people do it, they just kind of uh, raise it up. Um, I mean, it's okay for the shafis just to raise it up to their shoulders. I mean, that's what they do, right? Number two. Um, actually, the, the fingers don't have to be together. They can, they can be, uh, they, they, they're spread out. They, they just left an, at their normal, uh, the, the fingers left at their normal uh, position. The thumb needs to be stretched out to the ears. The, the fingers don't have to be together. That was a mistake. This is for men. For women, it's up to the shoulders. For the, for the women, it's up to the shoulders in the Hanafi school. It's also sunnah for the muqtadi, for the follower to say Allahu Akbar at the same time as much as possible with the Imam and not to delay in doing so otherwise he misses a very very uh, virt a great virtue there's a great virtue in the first saf in the first row there's also a great virtue in making in catching the takbiratul ula which means to catch the takbir so if you're prone to doing these long intentions some people have this habit of standing and saying inni wajjahtu wajhir illadhi and saying out uttering these things out and imam begins and then you hear all of these people doing that do it that from before don't miss the don't miss this uh, synchronization with the imam as close as possible don't uh, it shouldn't be before the imam though it should be just after it could be just after yeah, or, or together together would be fine So now, uh, once you do that, then the, th the, the, the next sunnah, the fourth sunnah, is to place the hands together. And the way to do this is, in the Hanafi school, is to put the concave of the right palm into the convex of the, uh, 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 or the wrist actually, uh, the bend of the wrist of the left hand, perfect fit. And uh, you form a loop with the thumb and, uh, uh, and the little finger. And the three fingers, the index, middle finger, and ring finger need to be flat on top, right? So it's a very, very natural pose, like that. And place under the navel. This is for the men. For the women, it's the right palm on the left, uh, the right palm on the, on the left on the chest. And the, the, the women just just put the hand on top. They don't have to form a ring or anything. They, it's just literally a flat right hand on the, on the left, on the chest. There's no 
there's no, no more details about that. The other thing is some people have this habit of raising their hands and then kind of doing this special show of uh, uh, the special action of this uh, putting the hands uh, or uh, down, dropping the hands down and then tying them. So that they, they raise their hands, then they drop them to their sides and then they tie them. There's really no need to do that. And likewise, to, uh, there's some people who raise their hands and then kind of outstretch them in the front and then, uh, and then tie them. That's also not necessary. It's directly from the ears to joining them together. Some people do this with style. <laughs> Thereafter that is to recite the thana. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. The dua. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Wa tabarak asmuka wa ta'ala jadduka wa la ilaha ghayruk. So that is sunnah to recite. After that you read A'udhu Billah and Bismillah if you're going to recite Qira'ah. If you're going to recite Fatiha. Which means this is only for the Imam or the person reciting alone. The person performing alone. Because they will be reciting Fatiha. But a person who's following the Imam is not going to be reciting Fatiha. So he doesn't have to say A'udhu Billah and Bismillah. A person following the Imam should only recite Thana. And that is only if he catches the Imam in the beginning or in a place where the Imam is not reciting aloud. Once the Imam begins his Fatiha aloud, then the Muqtadi, if he joins in the, with the Imam, then he should delay reciting his Fatiha, uh, his, his Thana. The Thana is only Sunnah to recite if you can catch the silence of the Imam. So if you join the Imam from the beginning, you recite Subhanakallahu wa bihamdika, before he begins to recite, that's fine. Otherwise, when he begins to recite, why should you be allowed to recite Thana if you can't recite Fatiha? Whereas Fatiha is much more emphasized. So it's for the same reason. So if you're able to catch a gap, then you can recite your Thana. And if you've come in late and missed the Raka'ah, then your Thana can be recited when you initiate the completion of your own prayer afterwards. After the Imam makes a salam, you get up to complete your prayer, you can recite Thana then. That's when you should recite Thana. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdika wa tabarak asmuka wa ta'ala jadduka wa la ilaha ghayruk. And number seven, to recite, uh, right, the ta'awudh, which means a'udhu billah, then to recite the bismillah at the beginning of every rak'ah before reciting Surah Al-Fatiha. Again, this is only for Fatiha. This is not an independent sunnah that you should do it even if you're not going to recite. And then to say ameen on the completion of Surah Al-Fatiha. The Surah Al-Fatiha itself was wajib. But to say Ameen afterwards for everybody is Sunnah. But to say low according to the Hanafis is more preferable. And to recite Rabbana wa lakal hamd after Ruku before Sajda. To recite Rabbana wa lakal hamd is a Sunnah. And Sami Allahu liman hamida needs to be recited silently. That's a Sunnah to recite it silently. And not to bow the head while saying the Allahu Akbar. So to stand up erect straight when saying Allahu Akbar, the opening Allahu Akbar, it's a sunnah. There's no need to bow the head down when saying Allahu Akbar initially. The head can keep straight up, that's a sunnah. And uh, it's sunnah for the Imam to recite his takbiris loudly, it's not wajib for him. It's, it's sunnah for him to recite them loudly. The men should spread their feet. How, how do you stand? So for the men, there's two opinions in the Hanafi school. One is that there could be a gap of four fingers in between. This is also one of the views in the Shafi'i uh, school. And the other opinion is that the feet could be in any comfortable posture. Any comfortable distance can be kept between them. This is also a view of the Shafi'is as well. It doesn't have to be linked to the next person's feet. That's not necessary. The reason for that was the purpose that they didn't have lines drawn at that time or any such feature in the masjid which could keep them straight. So when the Prophet ﷺ exhorted them to have straight lines, uh, they, that was one way that they joined them together. There's a hadith in Abu Dawood, Sunan Abi Dawood, which mentions that they even joined the knees together to do that, which was just to ensure a very straight line. And Shawkani makes it clear that this is, uh, this was, that was the maqsad, uh, that was the objective of it. 
right? So it's not something that needs to be taken literally because it was, there's no hadith which proves that it, it, that was that setup continued throughout the prayer. It would be actually very difficult to do that in ruku and sajda and everything else, right? So it's only for that. And when people say that you're putting gaps in between yourself, then what about the big gap that comes in between your own legs? So that's not an issue. You know, the, the, the issue of gaps, where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said as the hadith in Bukhari, hadhu bayn al-manakib. You know, um, bring, the, the, bring the shoulders level. So the connection needs to be from the shoulders, whether the feet are touching or not. It's not an issue. Right? Now the way we should deal with this, because there are many people who actually insist on this issue. And there are many people who run away from this. So the way to deal with this is if somebody wants to do it, let them do it. You know, don't criticize anybody. It's not haram to do it. But, um, and if somebody doesn't do it, then leave him alone because it's not necessary. This is what happens sometimes you draw your feet in, you know, you're standing in, in your own comfortable posture and the person next to you puts his feet right next to yours, you know, which is even beyond his shoulder, beyond his shoulder width. And that's not necessary at all. Because the Prophet wasallam, all he said was that put your shoulders together and fulfill the gaps. And it was not from the feet. Now, the other sunnah of the prayer is that uh, what should you recite? For the Fajr and Dhuhr prayer, it's sunnah to recite from the Tiwal al-Mufassal, which means the surah from Surah Al-Hujarat, any surah from Surah Al-Hujarat, which is in the 26th juz, until Surah Al-Inshiqaq. Inshiq, إِذَا السَّمَاءُ انشقت. Those are considered Tiwal Al-Mufassal, the longer surah. So to recite one of those in each rak'ah, in Fajr and Dhuhr is Sunnah. That's Tiwal Al-Mufassal. The medium ones which should be recited in Asr and Isha, are uh, from Surah Al-Buruj to Surah Al-Qadr. Inna anzalnahu fi laylatil qadr. And the Maghrib is when it's Sunnah to recite the shortest, uh, the shortest of the surahs, which are from Surah Al-Bayyina to Surah Al-Nas. From Lam Yakun Al-Ladhina Kafir, although that's the long one, but it gives you uh, one or two long ones if you need a long surah. It's sunnah to recite that. However, you, you know, you can recite other parts of the Qur'an if you feel like doing so. But this is uh, something that you can follow much of the time to be sunnah. A musafir though, can, should, you know, for him it will be sunnah to recite any surah. Because, you know, to say that you'll only get the reward of sunnah if you recite Surah Al-Hujurat or one of the long surah and he's in a hurry, then that's not what the Sharia you know, that's not, that, that's against, the, uh, you know, that's against the ruh and the spirit of the sharia. It makes it easy and convenient that you can get your rewards even when you're traveling by reciting anything. We uh, will give you that allowance. Number 17, to lengthen the first rak'ah of the fard of fajr. It's sunnah to recite more lengthy in the first rak'ah of fajr because that's a time when people are getting up and coming to the masjid so it's to encourage them to come. So number one, it's already sunnah to recite a long surah and the first rak'ah should be longer than the second one so that they could get the first rak'ah and to recite Subhan Rabbi Al-Azim in Ruku and Subhan Rabbi Al-A'la at least three times both of them in the sajda Subhan Rabbi Al-Azim in Ruku, Subhan Rabbi Al-A'la in sajda at least three times anywhere, anywhere beyond that should increase them in twos is mustahab but three is the minimum and number 20, to grasp the knees with the hands in ruku for men. To grasp them, which means to hold tightly onto the knees with the fingers spread out. The knees, not above the knees, not below the knees, the, the knees should be grasped. The way to make uh, the best sajda is to have the legs standing up completely erect, the hands outstretched, completely outstretched, holding the knees tightly and the back in a straight line with the bottom and the head. In a, in a straight line, so it performs a perfect um, triangle, right? That's the best sajda uh, to, to be done. Uh, that's the best ruku to be done, sorry. And all of these are different. To keep the back flat is a sunnah. To keep the leg straight in ruku is a sunnah. To keep the head level to the back in ruku for a sunnah for men. And 
for women they do it differently they they can it's not sunnah for them at all to be that straight in fact they they go down the hands are kept together as much as possible and they kind of just touch the knees they don't have to grip onto them and they quickly recite subhana they don't have to have tumanina in there the tumanina is more for men for the women especially in ruku they just go down quickly recite their surah uh, their and then they come back up unless of course they want to do a very lengthy enough prayer or whatever but this is the normal ruku for women and they don't even have to the, the legs don't even have to be completely straight they they actually left bent slightly then after ruku to stand up with ease some scholars according to imam yusuf this is wajib so according to some scholars it's actually fard to stand up after ruku and you know uh, for you to be completely at uh, repose in that as well thereafter going down into sajda it's sunnah to put the knees down first then the hands then the face and getting up the opposite way which is to lift the face then the hands then the knees if you're going back up after the second sajda also the other thing uh, you should observe is that when going down into sajda you should try not to bend forward you should not try to go down in drooped fashion you should try to go down straight with the back straight so kind of just slide down and then touch the knees and then the hands and then the face according to some scholars you can grip your uh, you can um, take assistance from your knees hold your onto your knees or your thighs when going down and others say no because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi only told you to do that when coming back up Ista'inu bil rukab So he said it's not in the beginning So there's some uh, of the Hanafi scholars who insist that You should keep your hands to your sides Away from your body when going down So you should just kind of slide down completely Coming back up though The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said You should take assistance from your knees So you, you hold on to your knees when coming back up Now if your trousers are very tight You should try to avoid wearing such tri- tight pants or trousers that would bunch at your knees and inconvenience your sajda prostration and necessitate each time for you to pull them up but if you are in that kind of condition then it would be okay to pull it up just enough for it to make it conven- more convenient for you to make your sajda but to hab- have a habit of always having to shift up your uh, trousers, pants uh, it would be makruh to have a habit of doing that all the time because it's unnecessary once you insist that to keep the for the men to keep the stomach away from the from the from the knees and thighs and to keep the arms away is a sunnah and uh, how much space should there be the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to keep enough space for a, 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 a baby goat a kid to go through but obviously if you're in a congregation then you don't want to stretch your hands out arms out too much because of inconveniencing the person next door so you can keep them together uh, you know closer to your sides but not on the ground then the question arises is that if you're in a tahajjud prayer and you want to do a lengthy sajda and your arms get tired can you put them down they said well then in that case you can take assistance from putting them on your thighs on the side of your thighs and not on the ground so the ground should be avoided because the Prophet ﷺ said so this is for men for women their sajda is done very differently where their, their stomach touches the knees they're, they're, they're compacted much very close together and the arms are close to the side and they could be touching the ground because that hadith does not refer to them according to the Hanafi school saying Allahu Akbar when going into sajda is a sunnah so all the Allahu Akbar beside the first one is, are all sunnah and then obviously saying takbir when ri- rising from the ruku is sunnah Placing the head between the palms when performing sajda. The, the place the hands should be, the hands in sajda should be placed in the same position that they were when you started the prayer. When you started the prayer, the hands were level with the head, with the ears. So in sajda, that's where they should be. They should not be behind by your shoulders and your head be in front. They should be on the sides of your ears. In this case though, the hands need to be close together when placing them. Subhana Rabbi al-A'la, three times is sunnah in the sajda. Sitting between the two sajdas is sunnah. Now if a person gets up just slightly from his first sajda and get, gets back into the third sajda, into the second sajda, 
into the second prostration, that will be considered just one long prostration. It will only be considered a second prostration as long as he comes up enough for him to be closer to the sitting posture than to the sajda posture. But it's sunnah to come all the way up. And it would be considered fard to come up at least close enough to sitting, to be more close enough to sitting than to be close enough to the sajda. Otherwise, why is it fard to come up until that much? Because if you don't come up that much, you can't do a second sajda. From, you cannot enter a second sajda into the first sajda from the first sajda. You have to come up sufficiently to be closer to sitting. Then you're considered out of the sajda. If, you're, if, you're, if you just come up slightly, you're still closer to the sajda, you're in the first sajda. You just raised your head by mistake and you're going back down. That's what it's going to be considered as. All of these things should be, because you know, this is what makes our prayer more perfect. All of these things need to be observed. We're looking at it very technically, right? But this is what will bring the spirituality in it, because we're going to be doing it properly. This will cut our haste, the ujla, that we have in our prayer. And obviously, the more devotion and concentration you have in the prayer, the slower you'll be, the more tranquil you'll be, the more reposeful you'll be. So you see some of these scholars, the way they pray, is just so calming, just to watch them is actually calming because of the way they do it. You know, it should not be done in stiff movements. Some people they observe uh, reposeful, they're, they're reposeful meaning they allow their body to you know, stop moving after every single posture, but the actual movement from one posture to the other is too fast. When going into it's too hasty, it's, it's a very stiff, awkward movement. It needs to be made very calm, and very natural. So it should not be done uh, in a very kind of robotic fashion either, right? It should be done in a very calm mode, that, you know, uh, it feels, feels tranquil. Sitting down, the sunnah of sitting, between the two sajdas for instance. Now in the Hanafi school, every single sitting will be the same, which is the iftirash position which means to sit down on, with, with the left foot laid flat, sitting on the left foot, the bottom being on the left foot, and the right foot being out and erect up, with the toes facing the Qibla. That's between the two sajdas, that's in the first sitting, that's in the last sitting, and uh, it's the same throughout. With the Shafi's they have it different in the first one, they have iftirash in the first one, and they have tawarruk in the last one, which is to sit with, with both legs out to the right hand side, sitting with the posterior directly on the ground. This is how the women will sit in the Hanafi school. So the, uh, the, uh, the women in the Hanafi school will not do iftirash at all. They will always sit down with both legs towards the right outside, and the posterior on the ground. Now, when you're sitting, and you recite the shahud, which is sunnah, then you recite ashadu Allah ilai the shahada, when do you raise your finger, and when do you put it down, do you put it down, do you move it around? Um, there, there's uh, two opinions in the Hanafi school. One is that you raise, uh, uh, what you do is you keep your both palms flat while you're reciting the shahud. When you get to ashadu Allah ilaha, that's when you raise the, uh, that's when you raise the, the index finger, you form a ring with the thumb and the, the middle finger, and the last two fingers you curl inside. So it looks like this, and you raise your finger at ashadu la ilaha, at the nafi, which is the la ilaha, at the negation, that there is no God. You raise it to express that. According to many of the fit books, of the Hanafi school, it mentions when you say illallah is when you put it down in establishment of except Allah. So you raise it at the negation, you put it down at the um, establishment of illallah. Thereafter, do you keep it in that way with the last two fingers curled up and the ring formed, but with the finger down until the end? According to the Shami scholars, you don't, you put it back down flat. According to the other Hanafi scholars, especially from the subcontinent, other places, 
you keep it the way you formed at the shahada, which means you keep the ring, you keep that posture until the end. The muhaddithin among the Hanafi scholars, they are closer to the Shafi school, the Shafi opinion on this, which is to, when you say ashadu an la ilaha, you raise it, la ilaha adda la ilaha illallah, just like the first opinion, you don't put it down though afterwards, until the end of the prayer. You keep it up, فَأَنْحَاهُ قَلِيلًا There's a hadith, uh, they go by the hadith which is in Sunan al-Nasai, which mentions that the Prophet ﷺ, after raising his finger, he just put it down slightly. And uh, there's another hadith from Abdullah ibn Umar رضي الله عنه, it may be in Tirmidhi, which mentions that كَأَنَّهُ يَدْعُو بِهَا As though he was praying, as though he was supplicating with it, instead of having to raise the hands with the fingers. So that's the opinion I prefer, which is to leave it, just put it down slightly and not all the way down until the end of the prayer. And this is, I believe, uh, 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 an opinion of the Shafi school as well. But they, they, they would all be fine uh, for the Hanafi, the, both opinions would be okay according to the Hanafi school. Now to recite the Fatiha again in the third or fourth rakah is a sunnah of the fourth prayer only. But in any other prayer it would be, it would be wajib to recite the Fatiha again. Okay, now the next thing we have here is uh, when you get into the last rak'ah for instance, after the tashahud, you would recite the salawat on the Prophet ﷺ. This is a sunnah, very emphasized sunnah. Even if you're in a great haste, great hurry, and uh, th- this is something you should not miss. Although technically it's just a sunnah, but it should not be missed at all because in other schools it is uh, actually fard, like in the Shafi school, to recite salawat on the Prophet ﷺ in the last rak'ah is a fard. This salawat should be the one that relates to Ibrahim alayhi salam Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala ali Muhammadin kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim inna kahmidu majid Allahumma barik ala Muhammadin wa ala ali Muhammadin kama barakta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim inna kahmidu majid Following that you can make dua Now dua, uh, some opinions say Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fi al-akhirati hasana wa qina athab al-nar The other one is Allahumma inni zhalamtu nafsi ظُلْمًا كَثِيرًا وَلَا يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ إِلَّا أَنْتَ فَاغْفِرْ لِي مَغْفِرَةً مِنْ عِنْدِكَ وَارْحَمْنِي إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ In the fard prayer, you should refrain from, you know, any other extension. In the nafal prayer though, you can make more dua that have to do with only, that are only specific with Allah. You should not in the prayer make duas that you can ask from others. You know, like for instance, Oh Allah, uh, marry me to this prospective fiancé, right? Or give me a thousand dollars, right? Although you can ask Allah for this at any other time, but during the salat, because of that special position of the prayer, only ask what relates to Allah. Allah, Allah, grant me tawfiq, forgive my sins, things that only Allah can, you know, that we can only ask Allah for. So uh, a dua can be recited. Then to turn the face towards the right and then the left when making salam, the turning of the face is sunnah. So if somebody just said a salam, he would be out of the prayer because he's made the wajib, but to turn the face is sunnah. The imam should make intention for all the, uh, 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 when making salam, the imam should, uh, the imam should make s- uh, intention for salam to all the people following him, the angels and the pious jinn that may be present. And for the followers, they make the, include the imam in their intention of making salam. The salam is not just a, it's not just a uh, way of getting out of the prayer. It's a, a salamu alaykum, it's a dua, you know, peace be upon you. So you must intend who you're making that towards. So it's not just something to come out of the prayer with. It's something that it's a dua. So the muqtadis, the followers should intend the imam wherever he's standing. Which means that if you're on the right hand side of the imam, then when you make your left salam, you should include the imam. If you are standing on the left side of the imam, then you should include the imam on your right hand side, on your right hand salam. If you are standing in the middle, right behind the imam, then you should uh, include him in both. Otherwise you include those people who are on your right in your right salam, and those on your left in the left salam. Where is it best to stand? What's the most virtuous place to stand? The best place to stand is behind the imam uh, in the first saf, slightly towards the right. Because the way it works is that the biggest fadila goes to the right hand side of the Imam in the first saf, then 
to from behind him to the left side then the same in the th second soft third soft fourth soft so that's where if you have a choice that's where you should be trying to get your position the other thing that happens sometimes is that if if a scholar is in the second or the third soft or an elderly person or somebody's parents or, fa or somebody's father is in the third soft or something and um, the student or you know regular uh, another person is standing in front they see this elderly person or scholar or whatever behind them they want to switch places and give them that position in front sounds like a good thing to do although there's some difference of opinion about this but it's better not to why? because we are most we are most deserving of Allah's reward you know we must try to accumulate as much reward for ourselves as possible and that is a position of great virtue should not be able to give that up for anything in worldly aspects you put everybody before you when it comes to the akhirah you're first that's why in the etiquettes of dua as well when you make dua if you're making dua for the whole world and you're forgetting yourself that's shaitan because that's what shaitan did according to some of the narrations when they were told that there's going to be one individual who's going to be ex uh, evicted from the heavens he made dua for everybody he was considered very pious whatever Allahu alam of the narration but the, everybody is asking him to make dua, he's making dua for everybody else and then he gets caught up in it himself. So you should make dua for yourself, then for your own people, then for everybody else. You do make dua for others because that helps your dua to be accepted. أَسْرَعُ الدُّعَاءِ إِجَابَةً دُعَاءُ غَائِبٍ لِغَائِبٍ When Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the fastest dua to be accepted is when you make dua for somebody else. When an absent person makes dua for an absent person, when they're not, you know, when they don't, when the one does not know that the other one is making dua for him, when you're doing it purely out of sincerity, you're not doing it for show. So it's good, but you should always remember yourself first. So that, although there's difference of opinion about this, but if you're in the first saf or the second saf, you should stay there, unless of course somebody requests you or something, then it might be bad to turn him down. But nobody, no, normally that does not happen. Although others would probably say that you'll get the reward of letting somebody else go forward, so Allah is merciful, Allah is, has um, immeasurable, um, sorry, uh, you know, endless treasures and He can give you anyway. So that's the other opinion. But looking at it from a technical perspective, you should stay in the first stuff. It's sunnah for the, uh, although the masbuk, you know the masbuk, the one who came late for the prayer, now he has to complete a few rakats. Technically, after the tashahud, he could actually get up and complete his prayer. But it's sunnah and it's the regular practice to wait for the imam to say one salam, at least. To find out if he's going to do a sajd al-sahu or not. Because if he's going to do a sajd al-sahu, he should join in with the sajd al-sahu, with the prostration of forgetfulness. Then afterwards, when the imam is about to complete his prayer after that, then he should get up. This is always a big issue with the shafis because according to them, according to them, the Saddar al is done right at the end of the prayer, just before Salam, without even making a Salam. In the Hanafis, you make one Salam, then you make the Saddar al -Sahu. So if the, you have to wait for the Imam to make the first Salam, then as he's about to make the second Salam, then you can get up, because now you know that he's not going to make a Saddar al -Sahu. So it's Sunnah for the Masbuk, for the one coming in late to, to wait for that. The one who's praying alone, when he makes salam, he's going to intend the angels. Okay, now I'm just going to go through some of the adab of the prayer. They're, they're things which just complement the sunnah. Uh, they're just extra etiquettes of the prayer. I'm going to go through them quickly. One is that if somebody has long sleeves and a man should not have long sleeves but let's say they do have long sleeves then it's, it's sunnah to actually take them out initially they would have maybe long garments a cloak or uh, they would have just a, a shawl like in Hajj and Ihram so if it's covering your hands it's actually a sunnah uh, it's actually an adab an etiquette mustahab to take the hands out and uh, you know reveal them when raising them up to the ears in the opening takbir where do you look in the prayer? This is part of the mustahabbat or the adab of the prayer. Where do you look? Where should your eyes stay? I know in the Maliki school, it's, you look right in front of you. Right? You look right in front of you. In the Hanafi school, when you're standing up, you look at where you will be making the sajda. So you look in the place of your sajda when standing up. 
When making ruku, you look at your toes in ruku when bowing. When standing up again, obviously, you look in your sajda place. When making sajda, you, you basically look at the ground. I mean, there's really no need to look anywhere else. Uh, when sitting down in tashahud or in the qa'da, in the, uh, in the qa'da, in the jalsa, you look in your lap. You look in your lap. And when making salam, you look towards your arms. So you should avoid looking outside. Looking around in the prayer is considered a makruh. There's a hadith that says if you look up, your eyes may stay that way. Right? It warns that, so it's a warning. However, even moving your head won't break the prayer. It's makruh, to move your head only. If you move your chest away from the qibla though, that will break the prayer. Okay? So these are some of the adab. To look at the tip of the nose in sajda is where you should look. In sajda actually. At the tip of your nose. And to resist coughing as much as possible is a, is a adab and an etiquette of the prayer. To cover the mouth when yawning. Now how do you cover the mouth if you have to yawn? It's, it's an etiquette to cover the mouth at all times. Whether you're in prayer or outside prayer. However, it's normally mustahab to cover it with the left hand. With the, the back of the left hand. During the prayer though, if you're standing up, you normally would have your right hand over the left. So in that case, instead of, instead of totally dismantling your posture of your hands and using your left hand, just use your right hand. Because that would be the quicker thing to do in, in standing. And then in every other posture, you would use your left hand. I'm going to just clarify one thing. In some of the books, in some of the fiqh books, it mentions that the muqtadis, the followers, in a jama'ah situation, in a congregation, should only stand up. It's mustahab for them to stand up when, when the muqta, uh, when the iqama, when the call for comments, when the muqim says, Hayya ala al-falah. When he says, Hayya ala al-falah, that's when people should stand up. And the Imam should begin the prayer when the Muqim says, Qad qamat is salah. So when he's making his takbir, when he gets to Qad qamat is salah, the Imam should say, Allahu Akbar. Now obviously that's not followed normally. The second one, Qad qamat is salah. And in terms of the Hayya ala al-Falah, Hayya ala salah that the Muqtadi should get up only when the Imam say, when the Muqim says, Hayya ala al-Falah, this could only maybe apply to a situation when people are so organized and orderly, that everybody that comes in the masjid, you know, the community is such that they come and sit in perfect rows. Right? So they come and sit in perfect rows. So when the Imam does say, Hayya al they can just all get up. And by the time he finishes, they could say, Allahu Akbar, because they don't have to arrange anything. But normally the custom nowadays and, you know, the situation of the people is such that people come in, number one, at different times. They sit in different places. And it takes actually the Imam to actually sit, uh, you know, make them stand together first, it takes a while, right? And that's what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did many times. In fact, Umar radiallahu anhu said about him and about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that sometimes they would make them very straight. And he says about one of them that they, were, uh, th- they used to be so particular about this that is as though they were aiming with an arrow, you know, that they, they, were, they were trying to get it in such a straight line because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that if you, if you are not in orderly lines, then Allah will create a discord between your hearts. So it's very important, right? But this way you will, you, you may read it in certain fiqh texts, the reason for it could only apply to a situation maybe when... So to insist on it in any other place would be useless, why? Because people would miss their... If you're going to prohibit anybody from standing up until the muqim says, Hayya ala al-falah, right? People may miss their takbiratul ula, which holds a great virtue. So that, that's um, something to take into consideration. Inshallah, next time what we'll do is we'll talk about the whole prayer. Uh, now that we've m- mentioned the fara'id, the integrals, the shara'id, the external components, the internal components, the pillars, we'll mention them separately. We mentioned the wajibat separately, the sunnah separately, and the adab separately. Now we need to put all of that together. We'll do it in practice, inshallah, in the next session.